Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us. Um, good morning to those of us on the West Coast. Um, I'm Aisha Senchodri from Cytel, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Jay Park, who is a Director for Clinical Research Services at Cytel Canada. Um, Jay is a lecturer at McMaster University, where he developed one of the first courses in the world on introduction to adaptive designs and master protocols. Um, as a result, uh, he will be speaking on that topic today. Um, I also want to mention that Jay is very active with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, where he is a member of the Quantitative Sciences Group in the Knowledge Integration Unit. So as you're watching this webinar and thinking of questions, um, know that he's happy to take questions on method, on oncology, but also um, their applications to global health. Um, with that in mind, I will turn it over to Jay. So I'm very excited to talk about some of the new advancements that we have made in terms of methods under the master protocol, uh, what's called the basket and umbrella trials. Um, so for today, I'll be talking about two, uh, two, uh, two objectives. I have two objectives for today. The first is to discuss the concept of master protocols and subtypes uh, in basket and umbrella trials. We, we also discuss some of the important design considerations for these types of master protocols. You know, ever since in 1953, when we first discovered the, uh, the, the actual structure of the DNA, we have made various uh, key milestones and uh, advancements in genomics. We have, we now there's a rising interest in biomarkers and how they can be used to improve biomedical interventions and develop what's ca called uh, targeted therapies uh, towards more precision medicine and precision oncology efforts. So, um, so it is important to recognize how important biomarker guided trials and how they're becoming central part of clinical trial research uh, in, the, in, in uh, globally, and what what I mean by targeted therapies is that it, these are therapies that can specifically target the uh, diseases based on genetic makeup or other uh, predictive risk factors. So, you know, um, ever since the first tumor agnostic therapies uh, was approved by the FDA in 2017, the uh, FDA, among the other regulatory agencies, have been vital in promoting uh, these innovative uh, methods and master protocols are also referred to as com complex innovative designs. Um, and of course, the European uh, consensus, consensus statement was released a couple of months, so, couple of months ago, uh, earlier this year. So, okay, so we have to recognize that there's change uh, in clinical trial research, especially in particularly in oncology. So there's a number of increasing number of biomarker targeted therapies that are being investigated today and they're and also being now approved in oncology. We're now shifting away from all comers uh, histology and organ specific cancer therapies and moving towards more molecularly subdefined cancer uh, therapies as, as well as the tumor agnostic therapies that are um, independent uh, of their histology and organ location and that can as and which I'll talk about uh, throughout this presentation today. And so it is important to recognize how important the biomarkers and how uh, clinical research is changing. So with that said, I'll discuss, uh, now introduce the topic uh, of master protocols. Um, this is arguably the one of the hottest topic in clinical trial research right uh, at the moment. What they generally refer to is uh, they are a single overarching protocol developed to evaluate multiple hypotheses with general goals of improving efficiency and uniformity by establishing standardized procedures across multiple in, uh, trial institutions that are uh, enrolled, and uh, they form a, an eco the large ecosystem within the under the master protocol. They're open, uh, often categorized at, into three categories: uh, basket trials and umbrella trials, which are the which are the two main focus of my presentation today. But it is important to know that there are other types called platform trials, where you can add uh, and do interim analysis to drop um, futile arms early. Um, but it'll be we do have another primary article that's being peer reviewed on specific for platform trials right now. But for today's discussion, I'll uh, I'll limit the uh, discussion to mostly basket and umbrella trials. And uh, it is important to note that we completed 
uh, landscape analyses of uh, master protocols that have been either published or registered on clinical trial registries. Uh, we we conducted the first search uh, uh, search uh, a month after the FDA released their draft guidance, and throughout the peer review process, we had we updated the search again to uh, to satisfy the uh, BMT trials of the journal. Uh, and as of uh, July 2019, we can say that there have been 83 number master protocols that are registered, and even a couple of months after, this number is highly uh, outdated. So what's showing here is the uh, these the number of accumulating master protocols that have been registered uh, in clinical trial research, uh, clinical trial research, and you can see that in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, the number of master protocols uh, that are being registered and conducted is uh, rising at a rapid pace. And again, in, as of uh, March 19, 2020, as of today, uh, this number of 83 is uh, highly likely to be very underestimated. So I'll not talk about what a basket trial is. So it's a type of master protocol that aims to test one or more targeted uh, therapies across multiple types of diseases. So in the settings of oncology, uh, what this usually means is that there are usually multiple histological types of cancer, uh, but they all share a common target as uni unifying, unifying eligibility criteria. So these criteria are usually based on the molecular uh, alteration themselves that match the intervention's mechanism of action, be, uh, and this target approach is being, uh, being used very frequently because since since uh, the biomarker status of the tumor uh, can help predict whether the patient can res will respond to a specific intervention. So for instance, um, if, a, if there is a breast cancer patient with HER2 mutation, uh, providing them or treating them with a HER2 antagonist uh, will likely, um, will, can likely predict that whether the patient will respond to that specific uh, HER2 uh, treatment versus a non hu targeting uh, treatment since that tumor, uh, the patient possesses a tumor, can a tumor cancer with that specific uh, mutation. And it is important to note that since there are multiple uh, types of cancers involved in basket trial, they, their main aim is to identify uh, interventions that are agnostic to the tumor and histology. So here is a simple illustration of a non-randomized basket trial that's evaluating a single uh, targeted therapy. So you can see that there are three different tumor types uh, we can uh, that are being combined into a one uh, one single basket as they share a common molecular alteration target. Uh, and basket trial can also be randomized in that uh, um, at first. Uh, the single uh, you can randomize within the basket uh, to either the intervention or the control. An umbrella trial, on the other hand, uh, it aims is a type of master protocol that tests multiple targeted intervention for a single disease based on multiple different predictive biomarkers or other predictive risk factors. So, in in this case, on con in contrast to basket trial, it would only involve a single cancer type uh, if you are conducting a, an umbrella trial in oncology. But there are multiple targets that are used to stratify patients into different sub uh, cancer groups, and the, and similar to the basket trial, each of the sub studies. Uh, their patient, uh, their intervention is matched to according to the the cancer's uh, mutation type, and they uh, in it, they usually uh, in investigate multiple targeted therapies. Uh, let me just show this illustratively because uh, sometimes pictures say are more revealing. So here's an example of a non-randomized umbrella trial. Here, here's another that there's a single disease that is being stratified into three different sub-studies involving three different separate uh, targeted interventions. And then you can see that uh, within the, the patients are being assigned to different therapies here, not based on randomization, but rather based on what molecular alteration target they possesses. And of course, they can also be, umbrella trials can also be randomized in that uh, within each sub-study, you can randomize the patients to either the intervention or the control, uh, as you see here. 
And you can see uh, both by side by side between a basket and a balanced trials, it is important to note that a basket trials usually in a single basket involves multiple diseases where in umbrella trials, there's a single disease that is stratified into multiple sub uh, diseases based on their molecular alterations. Um, umbrella trials um, aim to identify sub-cancer targeted therapies, whereas basket trials, uh, their aim is to identify um, tumor agnostic therapies that can be applied to multiple diseases that share a common target. I'm just, I've just summarized um, what I've just said uh, multiple times. So basket trials, they, they aim to identify uh, tumor agnostic interventions, whereas umbrella trials, their aim is to identify uh, multiple sub-cancer target therapies. Okay, so are they similar in any way? So there, it is important to know that there are both master protocols. So uh, use of common molecular screening protocol that is used to determine eligibility, eligibility in uh, a patient's assignment to various interventions is done uh, using standardized procedures that establish through the master protocol. So across, um, it is common, it's particularly for umbrella trials, to involve multiple different institu trial institutions. So, uh, but between these institutions, they use standardized biomarker assays within the each uh, within the trial ecosystem. And this is one of the main feature of master protocols that should be noted for basket and umbrella trials. And again, the assignment, uh, the intervention assignment may or may not be done using randomization when there's both uh, biomarker guided master protocols. And just again, because uh, what you see on the right here is a figure that was adapted from a previously published uh, basket trial that was investigating this HER2 antagonist. Um, what this, what this uh, therapy is a FDA approved uh, for a metastatic uh, breast cancer patient that, uh, that was with HER2 mutate mutations. Uh, and what they aim to do in this basket trial is to they try to see whether this targeted therapy could be used across multiple different types of solid tumors that had HER2 amplification or mutations. So because they're combining different cancer types into a single disease, in her nature of basket trials can be described as unification of diseases. And you can see that they all share a unifying predictive risk factor such that, that can be targeted as a, with the uh, therapy, in this case, which is the HER2 mutations. And given that, um, given that each of the disease subtype is often a prognostic factor, uh, the, you can define patient subgroups based on these different disease subtypes, but they're usually not powered to detect subgroups, which I'll talk about in the subsequent slides. And umbrella trials, uh, so what we see on the right side is, is what was uh, adapted from the NICE, uh, NICE uh, current NICE's uh, anti-cancer therapy guidelines for advanced uh, lung cancer, and you can see that you can you can potentially stratify uh, advanced lung cancer into six different sub uh, sub studies based on their genetic mutation uh, from EGFR, ALK mutations, ROS1, PDL1 inhibitors, uh, so, and other types of mutation. So uh, in contrast to a basket trial, the nature of umbrella trial is patient stratification since they're, they use multiple predictive risk factors to stratify a single disease into multiple groups that are studied, studied as multiple different sub-studies. And it is important to know that each of the sub-studies sub are statistically powered by themselves. Um, and this as 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 uh, w one would do if you were conducting these sub studies independently. So what this table shows here is some of the uh, some of the key uh, three trial design characteristics that we saw from the publish and register basket umbrella trials that we were that were identified from the 2019 uh, landscape announced that we published. Um, 
while the, I, I have stated that the number of master protocols is likely to be underestimated now, from, it's likely to be greater than 83, uh, which was what, was what we captured in this 2019 uh, landscape analysis, but the design characteristics themselves are, uh, I, I believe, are pretty cons consistent. Um, so it is important to note that basket and balance trial, they're, they're more, mainly, their uh, nature has been mainly exploratory as either phase one or uh, two, but use of randomization in uh, umbrella trials tends to be more common than basket trial. There are only a couple of trials that use a randomization in a control group in basket trials. And um, again, the number of interventions that are investigated uh, vary between these two types of trials because, um, and in basket trials, more than half of uh, them uh, investigated only a single target of therapies where um, umbrella trials, the number of invest, number of interventions that were investigated were tend to be larger uh, with a median of five. Okay, so it is important to know, uh, now I'll talk about how similar and different basket and umbrella trials to other biomarker guided trials. So similar to other non-master protocol biomarker guided trials, uh, they both aim, they both heavily rely on omics technology to better characterize and identify potential predictive uh, uh, biomarker targets. Um, in contrast to other biomarker guided trials, basket trials, uh, their aim is to identify therapies that are agnostic to the tumor location and the histology types. While it's not, while in the past, uh, in phase one trials, they have used multiple, to, uh, they have recruited multiple tumors to just test for a, a existence of signal, but it is important to know that basket trials, uh, histology agnostic approaches are now considered to phase two and phase three evaluation where they're using um, a, a, a control to evaluate um, the clinical utility of various tr uh, targeted therapies. Okay, and as I mentioned before, the use of single master protocol with standardized procedure is one of the key differences that should be noted between these types of master protocols to other biomarker guided trials. Um, for instance, in umbrella trials, they are, um, that where a single disease is uh, stratified into different subgroup, uh, different groups, and differentiated into different sub-studies, um, use of master protocol is a key uh, key feature that allows for screening efficiency. So let me explain what what I mean by screening efficiency. So so if we assume that um, our target group is a breast cancer patient with mutation X, and the prevalence of this mutation is only 10%, then, and with to reach the sample size target of 100 patients, then we would expect to screen about 1,000 uh, breast cancer patients. So if I illustrate this here, is what we see here is on the left is how many patients you need to screen to reach uh, the target uh, eligible biomarker population, if we assume that there's a 10% biomarker uh, prevalent, then we would need to screen, um, as I mentioned, to reach a 100 uh, breast cancer patient with the biomarker of our interest, that we would need to screen uh, up to, uh, or likely about 1,000 breast cancer patients, given that the biomarker prevalence is at 10%. So, in principle, each of the sub-studies of the umbrella trial can be conducted separately as a non-master non protocol, and that is often the case. But you can see that we can, if we combine them into a single master protocol where uh, all the patients are screening to uh, see, uh, screen, uh, undergo one centralized screening, that we can actually achieve screening efficiency. So for example, if we imagine a number of trial with uh, five different types of biomarker targets, and they all have a prevalence of uh, 10%, then we would expect to reach 100 uh, patients for each of the sub-studies, then we would only need to screen 1,000 cancer patients. Whereas if you conduct them independently, these five, four, in a, overall, you would need to screen about five 
thousand uh, breast cancer patients for these um, different. If you conducted these five of the different sub studies independently. Okay, so now I'm going to switch some of the gears uh, and talk about some of the key design character consideration that uh, you need to make when designing umbrella and basket trout. Just it is important to note that these are general considerations, of course, for different specific research questions and context, there are specific clinical contexts, but some of the general key design considerations that should be considered are the following here. And I'll start with the biological plausibility uh, because I, it is the foremost, the most important design consideration. Because, because uh, t when we are in investigating whether certain targeted intervention strategy has merits of being uh, carried out to a phase three, for example, phase three trial investigation, for example, it is important to note, consider the biological plausibility. In the case of oncology, it is, it is very common for cancer to have multiple genetic mutations, but it can be it can be difficult to differentiate what is driving the mutate, uh, carcinogenic process and what is just being a passenger. So, so intervention strategy, strategies should, of course, target the driver mutation that are driving the underlying carcinogenic process, but this can be often very difficult to do. So having preclinical work that support or refute the, the bi potential biological plausibility as one of the consideration of the design is very important. And in addition to that, it is also important to consider the accuracy of the essays that are using uh, for your clinical trial. Conceptually, you can imagine that a targeted therapy will be more effective against a disease that possesses that truly possesses that biomarker target versus the disease that doesn't. But biomark, all medical tests, including biomarker essays, have some degrees of inaccuracy. No tests are 100% uh, accurate. So it, it can be expected a proportion of false positive patients that do not have the biomarker target of interest uh, are expected in your basket and umbrella trials. And we have shown um, that exploratory biomarker guided trials increasing false positive rates can reduce the statistical power. And given that the, the main concern for exploratory clinical trials should be your uh, type two errors, and because you don't wanna miss out on, you don't wanna falsely conclude that the truly effective intervention is shown to be uh, not uh, effective in your clinical trial. So concerning uh, false positive, uh, false negative rates of, uh, so with type two error or statistical power of your trial is important. and a collection of the biospecimen that will be analyzed to determine the eligibility criteria is important. Uh, you need to ensure that adequate uh, specimen collection procedure and uh, analyses are done and implemented across multiple inst trial institutions. Of course, having a centralized uh, processing and analyses established through the master protocol can help with this. Uh, in basket trials, for example, because you involve two different, um, I mean, multiple different tumor types, uh, the collects, the ease ease of the collection, uh, the, their quality and the yield should be uh, considered as part of the design consideration. For example, if you take, uh, if you imagine taking a skin biopsy versus a prostate biopsy, um, you know, it, it is much easier to collect skin biopsy because it's a less invasive uh, procedure, whereas uh, um, getting a biopsy from your a prostate biopsy will be much more difficult. But it is important to note that um, there are um, anatomical consideration for um, invasiveness and other uh, consideration uh, that should be made in terms of uh, the collection procedure. And next, um, patient recruitment is is one of the key determinant uh, determinant for any clinical trials, uh, whether they're biomarker guided or not. But it is important to note that the eligible, uh, the size of the eligible eligible patient pool is ultimately affected by your prevalence, as I've shown previously uh, in the previous slide. Um, so it is important to note that recruitment challenges can be amplified if, in fact, the biomarker uh, target of interest has a very low prevalence, so it is it, it important to consider the um, plan for comprehensive recruitment strategies to reach the target sample size 
uh, within the trial duration, uh, then this will be an essential as well. And the prevalence estimates of the biomarkers is often um, borrowed from the literature, which are not very uh, reliable at times. So this is one of the key considerations that should be made when planning uh, these types of uh, biomarker-guided trials. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm gonna show you is a simple uh, case study. Um, so you can see here, there are five different uh, trial sites um, as shown here. And what this, uh, what this figure is showing here is a percentage of the specimen that were uh, submitted from the, each of the trial sites that were analyzable. Uh, this was determined based on the actual uh, size of the bio, uh, the, bio, uh, the biopsies, and you can see that there were fewer uh, samples that were submitted from uh, that could be analyzed for um, uh, with a biomarker assay from site A, and because they were they tend to they were submitting biopsies war, that were uh, smaller in size, and and when we looked at also the prevalence of the uh, the biomarker target across different institutions, uh, we saw that. Um, there was something funny going on from trial site eight. So uh, while you're doing clinical trials, of course, you want to ensure that um, uh, adequate procedures are implemented before you do the trials. But it is also important to uh, monitor how the quality of the biosmic collection procedures um, from different sites um, as you are uh, during, throughout the trial. And uh, of course, sample size calculation is important for basket trials. Uh, it's is most common that sample size calculation is done for the overall cohort, and not uh, so it can be difficult to differentiate between responders and non-responders um, between different disease subtypes. Um, for umbrella trials, sample size calculations are multiple calculations are done for each of the sub studies. Uh, given that multiple uh, interventions are evaluated. Uh, and, and of course, using use of randomization is generally preferable because this can help determine whether the risk factor that you're considering as part of the targeted intervention strategies indeed are predictive of whether the patient will respond to that given uh, targeted therapy. And, but use of, uh, using a randomization is not always feasible, um, so it, but it is important to note that it can be difficult to differentiate between predictive and prognostic factors in non-randomized single arm uh, basket and umbrella trials. You, you could make statistical adjustments, but it's also important to note that adjustments are often difficult when you have smaller uh, data sets. And when you uh, use of control arm, uh, control is also an important consideration to, uh, should be made, um, given that uh, if there are multiple um, standards of care across different tumors, it can be difficult to pick a single control for the basket. Of course, it's um, you can use a placebo, a placebo if there is uh, no established standard of care. Um, in umbrella trials, each of the sub-studies can have its own power, and, and as I said before, powered accordingly. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my this, um, presentation today. So in summary, you know, I think it's we're at a very exciting point in clinical research and medicine. You know, I think we are a step closer to um, um, uh, turning precision me medicine from a concept into a reality with the advancement, uh, methodological advancements that we have made in master protocols and umbrella and uh, umbrella uh, umbrella and basket trials. But as I mentioned, some of the key, um, it is important to make some of the important uh, general consideration when you're designing these types of clinical trial research. And if you're like myself, um, if you want to, uh, if you are better uh, at comprehending things with uh, reading instead of uh, having someone give a presentation, you can refer to our primary paper that was published uh, last month uh, in the CA of Cancer Journal for Clinician. And you can refer to that here. Okay. Um, and yes, um, this is one of the, um, uh, 
one of the uh, one of the initiatives that we we are making within Cytel for um, educational service uh, purposes with trying to improve the general understanding of these sort of complex uh, innovative trial designs. So uh, it is important to note that we we are working currently working very diligently on a new book um, that uh, through Cambridge University Press on introduction to adaptive trial designs and uh, master protocols that will be uh, published uh, in early 2021. Um, but I will now take uh, give the floor to Asia who can describe some of the clinical services that we offer at Cytel. Uh, thank you very much, Jay. Thanks for that uh, presentation. Um, I would like to open it up to Q&A in just a moment, so start writing your questions um, into the question box. But uh, before we do so, I just want to take a moment to recognize that um, in addition to the educational services that Cytel offers, uh, we also provide a full range of software and services for the N10 design and analysis of clinical trials. So um, this includes our industry-leading system EAST, which is meant to design fixed, adaptive, and complex trials, um, as well as our exact portfolio for data analysis. Um, our services offerings have broadened in the past year. They now include biostatistics, real-world analysis, health economics outcomes research, and of course, statistical programming and data management. Um, having said that, um, I think I'd like to now, Jay, are we ready to take questions? Uh, yeah. Excellent. So we have a few questions lined up. Um, the first is about conducting outcome analysis in trials that are not oncology trials. And the question is, in trials that are not oncology trials, where outcomes can be measured differently in different indications, um, how would you suggest doing outcome analysis? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I have given, I think our group, especially within Cytel Canada, have given given uh, consideration of how we can extend um, these sort of uh, traditional or master protocol that are you know conventionally used in oncology um, so I guess it depends on the clinical context but um, you could use a composite outcome maybe um, that's a difficult question to answer because I, I can't think of a specific example where different outcomes would be used um, but in umbrella trials, you could differentiate uh, them between different um, outcomes as as one of the key considerations, as each of the different sub studies. Um, that's a very good question. Um, a tough one, I I got I have to admit. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure which uh, in um, who in the audience have asked, but if you have any suggestions or if you have any idea, um, I would love to extend this conversation. You have my email on the screen, but yeah, that's. Uh, that's a, uh, um, I didn't expect a, such a tough question so, so early in the morning, but that is a very good question. Um, I would love to uh, extend the conversation uh, after this talk, though. So if we ever ask, thank you for that, um, but please email me. Yeah, just to remind everyone, Jay is actually in our Vancouver office. It is uh, 9.30 in the morning there. So um, yes, it's a bit early. Um, but these are a great line of questions coming up. Jay, our second question is a two-part question about powering basket trials. Um, so the question is, in a basket trial with multiple disease types, um, is each disease type treated and powered as a substudy of a disease? And are they hierarchied in such a way that you first treat disease X, then disease Y, then disease Z, until you fail significance? Oh, I see. Oh, good question. So uh, it's um, from the uh, from the landscape analysis that we've done. Um, in majority of the times, they're not powered to detect difference between different sub disease types. Rather, uh, for each of the basket that that combines different um, diseases. So, and so that's first of all uh, because a lot of the basket trials, you know, either are single arm trials. They usually most often do uh, Simon two state design, and you know, recruit up to thirty patients, or even you know, for some of the larger ones, up to like sixty patients. So um, they are usually not powered to detect 
the difference between different sub diseases. Um, and you can imagine why, because then, uh, you know, I think in vascular trial, you're just moving away from how you're viewing the disease from, uh, you know, their uh, histological diagnosis to the molecular diagnosis. So uh, there have been different methods that are from other groups that they propose for pruning and uh, the mean, which means that they, each of the different sub diseases based on the response could be actually pruned off and the cohort uh, would include the ones that are responding on various um, uh, sort of the decision roles that you make. But um, the simulation work is very, very, is, you know, it's cool, but I think, I think uh, I would, uh, I don't know if, Robert Beckman is in attendees today, but uh, I would wanted to ask him a question about whether how his group consider different um, in, uh, enrollment rate, meaning that you know it's very difficult to predict um, which of the subtypes will actually come to the clinic. So I, I just wanted to ask him that question. I don't know if if he's, if he is in the audience today asking that question, but um, very good question. I hope that is a question. Excellent. Um, thank you, Jay. We'll find out if uh, Robert Beckman um, is in the audience um, in a moment. Um, but let's move on to the, our next question. Uh, so the question is, can you comment on the possibility of shared control arms in basket or umbrella trials? Okay. Um, is that the only is that the only question? Uh, yeah, that's that's it's a one part okay. question. Uh, sharing control could mean different things. So I think uh, one of the exciting uh, things that you could uh, consider is uh, borrowing the control arm data from um, a, a historical control. So you could you could augment your control group or just uh, do some propensity matching score to borrow uh, control so that you know you are actually just treating the prospective uh, patients with the intervention of interest um, that could have recruitment advantages and of course fiscal power advantages because um, you know I have yet to met a patient that actually wants to be recruited and randomized to the uh, control um, especially if that's a placebo um, so there's that um, use of control with um, and the if use of control concurrent control within the network uh, uh within sort of the uh which of the master protocol uh, i can't see why that's not being done but i think i think you need to be careful about different sort of um there might be a population drift between different disease subtypes um so uh i think it depends on the context and what data that you actually see great thanks um, our next question is about the general approach to basket studies um, in statistical planning. And the question is, should you assess efficacy on the whole population? Can you also assess efficacy on the subpopulations as secondary EPs? And generally, what statistical methods would you recommend? Oh, right. Um, so I think, um, as I mentioned, let me just ex you know give a specific example here. So. In a single arm, uh, non-randomized basket trial, they're usually powered uh, as a Simon two stage design, where the each of the cohort, um, if it shows, um, you know, certain uh, uh, fewer than number of uh, crucified response, then it would actually not be carried out to the second stage. So in that case, um, it you need to be careful because you have powered the entire trial on to detect the. Uh, uh, clinical um, response rate in within the each of the overall basket, so it can be difficult to conduct a, sort of a secondary uh, subgroup analysis based on different sub disease types. So, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, that I think other metal uh, other groups are working on different approaches where you could actually determine uh, which uh, disease subtype should be included in the overall basket uh, when you get uh, when you um, because, um, but that, I think that depends on the context here and with different disease subs, types that you use. Um, I think I think you can make there a different uh, statistical adjustment, but you know I think it, I think you have to be a reality is that if you recruit say across uh, you know ten different diseases and you have a sample size of ten on average for each sub uh, 
sub diseases, you have only three patients, then, you know, I think even the even the fancy statistical adjustment can be difficult to make because you only have three patients for each of the sub studies. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question um, reads, in the basket trial, since many tumor types are included, the efficacy benchmarks will be different. So how would you make a decision in that regard, particularly for a randomized trial? Oh man, that's a good question. Um, so could you, actually, could you repeat that question again one more time? Sure, so in a basket trial, um, since many tumor types are included, the efficacy benchmarks will be different. Um, how would you make a decision in that regard, particularly for a randomized trial? Right, so, you know, I think we have to look at uh, what actually randomization is mainly used for, is actually to, um, to it establishes a balance between the two groups on average, a balance of uh, observable and non-observable uh, characteristics. So in a randomized basket trial, if you could get enough sample size where you could ensure that randomization actually work, then you wouldn't need to make statistical adjustment because you would have uh, observable and non-observable um, uh, different uh, risk factors that are balanced between the each groups so um but it is different it is a very difficult uh very good question that you know each of the sub diseases uh disease subtypes have a different threshold um in you know up to this point uh, a lot of the disease that have been combined into a basket trial whether they're randomized or not uh, tend to be very um uh, sort of like underserved uh, clinical uh, disease subtypes where there's no really approved uh, existing therapies. Uh, so it's hard to differentiate. So in, its, in, in essence, anything that showed, uh, you know, promising response, for example, one of the tumor agnostic, one of the four tumor agnostic therapies that have been approved by the FDA, uh, they actually re receive a full approval based on just, based on tumor response, um, and uh, trial uh, the, uh, the response duration. Uh, it was actually uh, it was actually uh, Bermuda Finib in 2017. Uh, it's a BRAF in enzyme inhibitor uh, from the BE basket trial. Um, so it is possible that you don't need to conduct a randomized basket or umbrella trials to get approval. Is is if uh, it serves to um, address the unmet clinical need in these really aggressive uh, disease uh, types. Great. Um, so we have two more questions for you, Jay. Um, the penultimate question is: You mentioned that your landscape analysis of all registered and published master protocols was published in BMC trials last year. Um, could you talk a little bit about what motivated you to conduct this analysis and were there any surprise findings? Right. So our, our motivation uh, first was, you know, I think we've seen a lot of, we got a lot of questions from our students from McMaster University when we we're teaching them, Oh, you know, because we had our homework of saying uh, one of the the key term assignment that we assigned was actually, hey, can you actually identify one of the master protocols and critically evaluate them? Um, and a lot of the students were having a hard time actually finding the uh, uh, a type of master protocols. And when they did share their protocol or the found trial with, uh, with us, it actually didn't meet the uh, FDA definition or it wasn't in fact a basket or an umbrella or platform trial. Uh, there were a lot of the surprise finding or not so surprise findings that we found from the landscape analyses was that the terms, the terminology of master protocols and different subtypes in basket umbrella and platform trials were actually used very inconsistently uh, throughout. So, you know, I think there were several trials that called themselves a basket trial, but in fact, when you looked at them, they had only one disease uh, type and there were no multiple diseases. And for example, in umbrella, the, what, what was called an, uh, an umbrella trial, you know, it, it wasn't an umbrella trial, it was looking at just one um, sub disease type. So that was one of the surprise findings that we found, or not so surprise finding as well. We were somewhat discouraged um, 
that how the majority of the basket and umbrella trials have been used mostly in oncology, we expected uh, prior to conducting our landscape analyses that we would actually find more examples of um, these uh, master protocols that were conducted outside of oncology. And um, we, you know, you know, I, I, one of our passion in addition to education is in uh, global health. And our main interest is how trying to come up with how we can apply this master protocol framework to uh, global health or to, um, you know, address the health inequalities that exist in uh, low and middle income countries. So that was one of the um, one of the surprises um, that we find. But, you know, I think it's it's exciting also because, you know, I think we are really trying to advance um, these um, innovative methods and their understanding in non addition, not just the scientific community in US or other high income countries, but also in um, other uh, developing countries. Excellent. Thank you, Jay. So um, a couple of questions came in as you were answering that one. So I'm going to wrap them up um, into one long question. Um, so the question is, what do you think about machine learning based approaches and cross validation of results in these types of studies? And could you say a little bit about how basket and umbrella trials um, differ or relate to platform designs more generally? Yeah, um, I, I will admit that I haven't really thought much about how machine learning uh, techniques could be used uh, in specific to basket and umbrella trials, but I think that's an interesting question um, that's being asked here. I think, you know, I think with machine learning, there are just so many possibilities. So I think um, I, 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 I can't hone down to a specific example, but I just don't see why we need to, you know, only use the methods that were developing, you know, that were non-machine learning techniques. So I think, you know, I think uh, I don't believe that there is any um, bad methods, but, you know, I think if you were going to push for a specific method for the wrong clinical question, um, then, you know, then, then that method becomes bad. But, you know, if you apply machine learning or other methods or other approaches to the right clinical questions, so I think, you know, I think possibilities are endless. And so what was the last question? Right, so could you just comment a little bit about the relationship between basket umbrella, basket and umbrella designs versus platform designs more generally? Um, sure, um, so platform trials are referred to clinical trial designs that where you can um, um, conduct uh, interim analysis to end uh, or um, remove arms that are not, that are futile. Or they have, or that have a really low uh, uh, chance of um, showing um, efficacy. As well, platform trials can also allow for adding new arms uh, into the clinical trial within the trial ecosystem. Uh, they have ways of handling that as well. They uh, can allow for the standard of care to be updated if you do find. Um, within your trial or outside of your trial, there's a new standard care established. So uh, in both basket and umbrella trials, uh, those sort of uh, histologically agnostic or these sub-cancer uh, approaches can actually, you know, they, they can, in nature, they can be both, uh, they can be both platform trials uh, as well. So it's a bit of a, I didn't want to get into that today because I only had about an hour, but you know, it, it you can have a basket trial that is a platform trial in nature because you can have add new arms uh, within the uh, the trial ecosystem within the basket trial, and same for umbrella trials.